The uh, next topic is the applications of nanotechnology. Here we'll talk about the applications of nanotechnology. Just an introduction about the applications of nanotechnology. The approximately 99% of medicinal molecules don't raise their target and subsequently stain the body of the patient. As these molecules can sometimes be very toxic, particularly in case of those designed to target cancer. Now, everybody knows that whenever we have headache or body ache, we just go for the common tablet for all the eggs in our body, whether it is a headache or a hand pain or <coughs> leg pain. But now, are these tablets are good for our body? The answer comes to always not good to have the tablets, allopathic tablets. But if we are taking the tablets and those are going, not going to the target, even rather than let's say it is going nearby reason, like it is getting to all the reason. And this is the target cell which is causing any particular type of disease, say headache or body ache or cancer. <coughs> In these cases, the toxic elements of the tablets or drugs are affecting our body and because of that, it is not possible to say that they can cure completely the cancer or any other uh, disease. So, by the application of nanotechnology or such so the nanomolecules or nanoparticles, we can inject tablets at a particular cell which hits directly to the cell and it will not affect our other parts of the body, even other cells of the body. So nanotechnology is being used to separate transporting and delivering the drugs. It transport from one part of the body to another and it helps us to deliver the drugs from the right place. The single wall carbon nanotubes are used to make gas sensors. Again, an application of the carbon nanostructures, the CMD, which are made from the rolled structure of carbon. And those carbon nanostructures in the form of carbon nanotubes used to make the gas sensors. Again, it is very useful for the gas industry. Jack magnetic activity of the nanostructure. Sorry. It consists of wave of metal magnetic and non magnetic material which display the property of jack magnetic resistivity. It is the combination of conducting and non-conducting or magnetic and non-magnetic material which produce the giant magnetic resistivity and which improves the property, storage property of the material. The next one is the quantum dot lasers are used to read compact disease and the photovoltaic that convert light into electricity. We will talk about these applications in detail later in the time. This is just an introduction of the applications of nanotechnology. The next topic is the type of material. Now it's very easy to say that we know all the crystalline structures or you know, and crystalline structures are those which have the uh, long range order or which have the systematic arrangement of the atoms. Whereas in case of amorphous material we say they are not systematically arranged as well, the properties are short range in order. But what is the role of these type of materials in nanostructures? Remember, whenever we talk about the bulk material, as I discussed yesterday, that the bulk materials which are heavy size greater than greater than or equal to 100 nanometer are known as bulk. The bulk samples are having the crystalline structures, but when we talk about the smaller size particles like nano size particles, which are from 1 to 100 nanometer they are belongs to the amorphous materials where the uh, systematic arrangement of atoms is not possible and they are looking like the uh, short range order or short range forces. The amorphous materials are ubiquitous in natural, natural and engineered systems. The examples are well known, granular fault cause in earthquake faults and the thin film lubricants again it is an important thing and bulk metal in glasses. Whenever we talk about the glasses material, glassy material is not showing any type of X-ray diffraction. It is just like an error bar which shows that the this is the intensity and this is the two theta. So whenever you talk about the glassy material or amorphous materials, they will not show any X-ray in these peaks. And remember the characteristic peak of any material will give the idea about the uh, structure or crystalline structure of the material. Collateral dimension are another example. So what are the amorphous solids? Amorphous solids are comprised of particles, atoms, grains, bubbles, molecules arranged so that the location of their center of mass are disordered. That structure is essentially indistinguishable from a liquid 
However, these metals are jagged and exhibiting yield stress like a solid. So these are basically disordered structure which are not in fixed alignment. Other examples of metals material include collets and emulsions, foam, glass forming molecular liquids, sweat exams, and even living tissues are the best example of the amorphous solids. These are the some examples which are shown over here. The foam, grain, polygons, sand and all this. Now what are the crystalline materials? When we talk about the crystalline material, the first thing which comes in mind is the cubic structure. Simple cubic where we talk about the material where atoms are present on the edge or at the border of the cube. Then this is known as a crystalline structure and the best known is a cubic structure where all atoms are present on the edge of the cube and we say this is the simple cubic structure. In case of FCC or BCC, FCC is the body centered cubic structure and the FCC is the face centered cubic structure. When we talk about the face centered cubic structure, the atoms are present on the edges as well on the all the faces. And in case of body centered cubic structure, the atoms are present on the all the edges of cube and at the center of the cube. So this plan structure are the systematic arrangement of atoms in a material. Now, what are the important properties of crystalline materials? The first property is that they are long range order between structural units. It's very easy to say about that if I move my position from here to somewhere here and I just draw the environment around this atom and I find the same throughout the region, either here or here or here. So that shows the properties are long range in order. Second one, they have the crystal structure either periodically in 1D, 2D or 3D orders. The crystals, basically they are the single crystal materials. Crystalline is small order domain. They have the small order domain where you can say the properties can be defined very easily. The last one is the polycrystalline material consists of crystallites of varying size. Now, what is the meaning of crystallinity? Weight or rolling fraction of crystalline material in the sample is known as crystallinity. It is easily explainable by looking on the diagrams of the different type of materials. The first one is the crystalline. If you look on the crystalline material, it is having the systematic argument. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 atoms, systematic arrangement, then 8 atoms, 6 atoms, 8, 6, 8. So it is what we say the systematic arrangement of the atoms present in the crystalline materials. Whereas in case of polycrystalline material, they have the systematic element, but it is an irregular. Let's look over here. These are the systematic element, but not this one. Similarly, so these are the systematically arranged, but not this. So they are known as polycrystalline materials. And the last one is amorphous, where we said it is the irregular element of atoms where properties can be understood in terms of short range order. The microscopically a single crystallized atoms a near perfect periodic arrangement. Just look on this one. This is well periodic structure where everything is repeated after a fixed interval of distance. A polycrystal is a composed of many microscopic crystals. Just look over here. This is a reason, this is a reason, this one, this one. Here. So these are the crystalline reasons with non-crystalline or amorphous species. That's why they are known as what crystallites or grains. And an amorphous solid such as glass has no periodic element even microscopically. So from these three things you can understand the easiest way that crystalline structure are systematic array or systematic arrangement of atoms anywhere in the region, whereas in polycrystalline they have the crystalline structure but with the irregularity. And the last one is amorphous which are non-crystalline materials. Common crystals include snowflakes. The diamond and table salt, however, most commonly known solids are polycrystals. When we talk about the crystalline structures, the table salt, diamond, table salt, which is an ACL, which is having a systematic element in this form of a uh, simple cookie structure. So, diamond and table salt are this, and the most common in organic solids are consist of the polycrystalline structure because of the irregularity or disordered structure between the crystalline structures. The microcrystalline material. A microcrystalline material is a crystallized substance or rock that contains small crystals visible only through microscopic examinations. The best example is microcrystalline copper oxide. When I talk about the microcrystalline structures, they are the structure which are not observable microscopically. It means we need to observe them 
do the help of microscopic examinations and these exist in the very short range of these kind of structures. Now, the best example is microcrystalline copper oxide. The copper oxide is to exist in the microcrystalline structures. Now, quasi-crystalline material. This looks like the polycrystalline material only. A quasi-crystal consists of a uh, uh, of array of items that are ordered but not strictly periodic. Just like in the case of polycrystalline. Here, these items are ordered but not strictly for in the same position. System over here. If you are reverse, then also there is some disorder structure. So, that type of structures are known as quasi crystalline structures. They have many attributes in common with ordinary crystals, such as displaying a discrete pattern in X ray reflection and the ability to form shapes with these smooth plate crystals. This is the important property of quasi, -quasi crystalline materials. Quasi crystals are most famous for their ability to show five fold symmetry, which is impossible for an order. Ordinary periodic crystal. Now, this is the something which may be known to you that in case of crystalline material, symmetry is important. The best example is reflection. Suppose I have this is mirror, I will write this one, but this is like this. So this is the best way to understand this symmetry. The other one is suppose I have a structure, one is, atom is over here, another one is here. So, this is the reflected symmetry. After reflection, I will find the same environment of the atoms. In these cases, normal crystalline structure, five fold symmetry is not possible. Five fold. This is well known concept for the crystalline material where five fold symmetry is not possible, but in case of quasi crystalline material, the five fold symmetry is possible. Now, what are the quasi crystals? It's very easy to understand that they are periodic but not strictly periodic. Quasi crystals first discovered in 1982 are quite very, uh, rare in practice. Only about 100 solids are known to the form quasi crystal compared to four layer periodic crystal laser field day. So it simply shows that it is the rarest case where we have only a short number of quasi crystalline material for four layer. The 2011 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to time that's meant for the discovery of quasi crystals. Next one is the nanostrand material. As I discussed yesterday, wherever I use for the nano, it means something of the material is in the range of nano. And same thing occurs with the nanocrystalline material. Nanocrystal is a crystalline nanoparticle. Nanocrystal may be defined as any crystalline nanomaterial with at least one dimension, less than 200 nanometer, or more generally, a nanoparticle with any kind of crystalline structure are known as nanocrystalline. Now, it is the just opposite to what how we started in the first that the most of the nanocrystalline nanomaterials are amorphous, but some of the material shows crystalline structure even at the nano level. Those type of materials are known as nanocrystalline materials. <coughs> when we talk about the zinc ferrite, it forms somewhat the crystalline structure even at the 40 nanometer. Now, crystalline nanoparticles are of interest because of many reasons. The first one, silica nanocrystal can provide efficient light emission even while pulse silica, the silicon does not and be used as for memory component. This is an important thing that in case of silicon nanocrystal, they provide efficient light in case of nano, not in the bulb. The bulb samples are not releasing any energy for the memory component. The second one, Nanocrystal embedded in solid can exhibit much more complex binding behavior than the conventional solid and can form the basis of special class of solids. So by using nanocrystals we can change the properties of material in the nanorism. This is all about the type of material we discussed today, that the, what are the crystalline materials, then amorphous, then microcrystalline, quasi-crystalline and nanocrystalline material. This covers an important part of our syllabus. The next topic is again an important part of our syllabus. How to understand the development of nanomaterials. It's, it's very easy to say that uh, in 1960 or 1959-60, Richard Fennel said there is a plenty of room at Waterman. We just started to work on the 
nano structures. All structures which are having dimensions less than the 10 to the power minus 6 meter or micrometers. But is that 1960 is the period where nano started or it started to work in our social world or daily world? Then the answer comes yes. After that time, we try to understand that maybe some existence of the structures which are having size of 10 to the power minus 9 meter. But remember, the name given to this technology as 10 to the power minus 9 meter something is nanotechnology in 1976. But the nanostructures are known thousands of years before. So we just started with some introduction and just try to understand that how nano materials are developed or destroyed of the nanomaterials. The first one, the scientific story of nanomaterials or began much later. One of the first scientific report is the colloidal gold particles synthesized by Michael Faraday as early as 1857. Everybody knows about the contribution of Michael Faraday in the field of cell and electrolytes, where he used colloidal gold particle in the electrode. And the interesting fact which is known after 1970 that the gold particles which are used in the electrodes are in the range of nano. The second one, nanostructure catalysts have also been investigated for over 70 years. Even before 1960 or 70, 70 years before everybody knows about the catalyst. Catalyst is what? Something which is not actually involving the chemical reaction but it enhances the property or it enhances the rate of reaction. So the catalyst we are using 100 or years before but nobody knows that those catalysts are in the size of 10 to the power minus 10. By the early 1940s, the precipitate and fumed silica nanoparticles were being manufactured and sold in USA and Germany as substitute for ultra fine carbon black for rubber reinforcement. The best example, one which I have given in the class, that rubber industry is having the most important part is the rubber. Rubber is having uh, polymer or polycarbon structures. The material used in rubber is having few silica nanoparticles which are used for the carbon black for the rubber reinforcement. Nanosized rubber silica particles have found large scale applications in many everyday consumer products ranging from non dairy coffee, creamer to the automobile, dye, optical fiber and catalyst support. So these are the things actually which known to our world but not on the name of nano. We use them but no basis is these are nano the size. In the 1960s and 70s, metallic nano powder for magnetic recording caps were developed. The first invention of computer started in 1960 but that time to record the memory, to record the uh, what is saying? The storage capacity of material is depending on the magnetic recording and magnetic recording and even at the help of the magnetic uh, <coughs> nanobox only. In 1976, for the first time, nano crystal produced by now popular inert based operation. It is a technique to produce nanostructures. We discussed that in the was produced by Greg Mist and Gaurav in 1976. And this year only, the term nano energy is given. Same way, if you want, you can just try to understand the historical development of the nanomaterials. Like in few years back, it has been found that the Maya blue pen is nanostructured hybrid material. The pen which we, we are using to print our walls are also having nanostructured materials. The origin of its color and resistance to acid and bioversion are still not understood, but studies of authentic sample form. China, Iceland show that the material is made of little shape uh, polyphoscite intercalcates of amorphous, which is again a nano size sample. Probably most celebrated comment on advancement of nanomaterial was the public speculation by physicist Richard Finger in 1959, which I already discussed yesterday that there is a lot of space, there is a plenty of space at bottom or plenty of room at bottom, which gives a new idea which opens the door for the scientists to work on the lower technology means lower size particles or lower size materials. Now, historical developments in nanomaterials, how nanomaterials are used or are application, application are in daily life. 
Today, Enterprise Engineering expands in a rapidly growing number of structural and functional material, both in organic and organic, allowing to manipulate mechanical, catalytic, electric, magnetic, optical, and electrical functions. See, when we talk about the nano, as I discussed in last class, that nano is not about only to look on the size in the order of 10 to the minus 9 meter. It is all about understanding the material and improving the material by changing their structures. Like in case of nano phase, where will you talk like nano, magnetic nanoparticles or electrical conducting nanoparticles or anything where we can put atom by atom to improve the property of material and by changing the structure and functional uh, function of material we can change the inorganic and organic properties of the material and which allows us remember it starts with the chemistry of the material then we talk about the physical properties so by changing structural and functional properties we can change the inorganic and organic properties and by the help of these two properties we can allow or we can change or we can manipulate the most of the properties of material like mechanical properties like we talk about their strength, their stamina and all those the catalytic property by the help of nanostructures we can increase the catalyst property of the material then electric property, magnetic property as I discussed earlier also the electric properties Michael Faraday has given the concept of electrode by the gold particle and by using gold and particle I can increase the electric property of the material even those which are uh, insulators at my, my micro world are conducting at the you know, level. The magnetic property are easily enhanceable by the, uh, reducing the size of the material <coughs> as well as optical and electronic functions. When I say it's electronic function, it means it helps us to understand that the electronic properties can be changed, changed by the use of nanomaterials and carbon nanotubes, single electron transistor then FET with the nanostructure are very important in the electronic industry. The production of nanophase or cluster assembled material is usually based upon the creation of separate small crystals. See, these are the few words which are important to understand, important to realize. It's not about the, some of the right lines are written and we just say, okay, fine, we'll do the learning or and write in the exam. When we talk about the nano materials then how it works for us first of all we will make their nano structures small structures which are placed atom by atom now when I say I arrange the atom in a particular way where I can change the property of material or I will get the enhanced material then these nano crystals are in the size of say 10 to the power minus 9 meter now what we will do how to implement these small clusters, small crystals, some small materials into bulk material? The best example, like nowadays uh, in US or some other countries, they are using waterproof clothes. Even if you pour the water on the cloth, normal cloth which I am wearing, even in the case of cotton also, if you drop the water on that, it will not wait. Now, the important thing is how it happens. It is not possible to make the complete shirt by using nanostructures. So how can I improve the property? So I'll make a nanocrystals, I'll make some material which change the material strength or material properties if I impart these nanocrystals inside that. So in case of nano phase or nano materials, what we do, the production of nano phase or plus assembled material is usually based upon creation or separated small cluster clusters which then are fused into the bulk material or on their embedding into compact liquid or solid materials. So this is what you have to understand that production is important and production can be done, done at the small level only or in the form of small nano clusters or crystals and how to impart, how to embed them that is the most important thing and most important challenge for the nano industry. Now what are the challenges in nanotechnology? Suppose I'll say I will prepare a sample of uh, 10 nanometer. My technique, which is known to me, I'll make it within 7 or 8 days with the very least cost. Even by using laboratory grade uh, chemicals 
I say, uh, by uh, having 2,000 rupees per meter, I can prepare the sample in the order of 10 nanometer. But now, is it useful for me? If yes, then how can I use it? Number two, if I use it, then how to embed in the world? How to embed in the material? Because it's very easy to produce the nanostructures, but the fabrication is important. So whenever we talk about the challenges in nanotechnology, the most important one is the fabrication and processing of nanomaterial and nanostructure. So how to fabricate it, how to process it, that is an important thing. So what are the major challenges for the nanomaterial? The first one, to overcome the huge surface energy, a result of the enormous surface area over larger surface area to volume ratio. Yesterday we talked about how the surface area of part by material is changing as we are moving towards the smaller size. So in case of nanostructures, which offers an enormous increase in the surface area is also having a huge surface energy. Now how to control this energy and how to overcome the energy of those materials. That is important. Second one. Like we said we prepared the nanostructure. Now suppose I have one gram of material and it having 10,000 nanoparticles. Now all the 10,000 nanoparticles are of the same size of uniform size distribution. Their morphology is same. What about their externality? What is their chemical composition? And how we can understand their microstructure. That all together is a desired physical property. Because it's not easy to say that I got the nanostructures. Now, when you got the nanostructure, when you prepare the nanostructure, the important thing which gives the complete idea about the physical properties are all of the atoms must have the same size. Then suppose I say I have to prepare a sample of 2 nanometer. Now it looks very easy that we can get the Two nanometer size particle, but remember that two nanometer size particle is an average size. When I say I calculate it or I observe the size of material in the order of two nanometer, for my, my even my own prepared sample, I got the two nanometer, but that is not actually two nanometer. It varies from one to ten nanometer. And as usual, by statistical distribution, what we say, I got the average width or average size of material is two nanometer. But that helps good for the research but not for the uh, property changing materials or nano size materials. So, to make the sample, to prepare the material of desired size is the most important challenge. The second one, uniform size distribution. Suppose I have a particle in the area of 10 cm square. Now, all the atoms which present on the 10 cm square area are of the same size or not. Second one. What about the morphology? Crystalline heat, chemical composition. Chemical composition again, it may be possible that what you are preparing is having some chemical composition, but actually in nanostructure it's very tough to find out the exact chemical composition. So I'm not sure about the this prepared kind of material is having the same chemical composition which we are assuming. And microstructures that all together result in desired physical properties. So when I say nanostructures, if I make all these transformations or all the properties are having in the R range, then I can say the physical property of material is due to these nanostructures. And that is the biggest challenge, especially this and this one. Uniform size distribution and desired size. Third one, prevent nanomaterials and nanostructures from passing through either Oswald wrapping or agglomeration as time develops. It's very easy to prevent sample, but now is it possible to short out them atom by atom or particle by particle, which is again a press task. And if I put the nanostructure somewhere, then agglomeration is also a task with the time goes on. So how to prevent the agglomeration? of the nanostructures. Fundamental issues in nanometer. It's easy to say that these are the major challenges, but what are the fundamental issues with the nanometers? We start with a very easy one and now all these are already under discussion for our classes. But the first one is the ability to control the scale of the system. Means is it possible to control 
the size of the system. I say I have to buy a 10 nanometer and can I cut the 10 nanometer size particle, etc. Second one, ability to obtain the required composition. Again, as I said in the last one, that the chemical composition is important and now desired chemical composition is possible or not. Because when I say ability to obtain required composition, not just the average composition, but details such as defect, concentration, gradients, etc., are possible or not for linear materials. Third one, ability to control the modulation, dimensionality, during the assembly of the nano size <coughs> building blocks. One should be able to control the extent of the interaction between the building blocks as well as the architecture of material itself. We prepared it, but how we can make the building blocks or how we can prevent the interaction of the building blocks with the near and blocks. Next one, the fundamental issues in material also, in recognition of that. More specifically, the following issues have to be considered for the future development of nanometers. The first one, development of, of synthesis and or fabrication method for raw materials, powder as well as for the nanostructure material. Now when I say I will prepare a nanostructure, then how to develop a synthesis process or fabrication method for a particular type of material. I say I got the chemical from market and I prepared the nano size of say over zip right. Now how can I make sure that the material which I am getting from market is the pure enough to get the desired composition of material. So for preparation of raw material and then for the nanosecure material, these are the two important stages which we need to cover in case of the nanostructures. Second one. Better understanding of the influence of the size of building blocks in nanostructure materials. Remember, it is just repetition that what we are saying about the building blocks. So, how to understand the influence of size of building block in nanostructure material as well in, uh, as well as the influence of microstructure on the physical, chemical, and mechanical properties of the, these materials. Now, if I say I am having some materials like covers in ferrite or ferrite or gold nanoparticle or silver nanoparticle. Suppose I have a uniform distribution, then everything looks fine. But for non-uniform distribution, non-uniform distribution of size, how the nano size particle will interact with the micro size particle. Now whether they behave as the same or not. If not, then how microstructure and nanostructure uh, <coughs> interaction change the property of material, so physical, chemical and mechanical properties. So these are the things which are important for a material to understand how the nanostructures are behaving or how nanostructures are affected by the microstructures. And their interaction are the most important because as we have started that it is possible to prepare nanostructures but of desired size, of desired chemical composition, of desired uniform uh, size distribution. These are the important things which is required to understand and required to develop. Some other fundamental issues in my material. The first one is better understanding of the influence of interfaces on the properties of nanostructure material. Now, what is the meaning of interfaces? One is nano, other one is micro. How they, their interface will interact and change the properties of material. Development of concepts for nanostructure material and in particular their elaboration. We need to understand the properties of material or concepts for their elaborations. Investigation of catalytic application of mono and chromatic nanomaterials. And the last one is the transfer of development technologies into industrial applications. As I said, it's easy to say preparation can be done for 2, 10, 50 or 80 nanometer sample by the different methods, by different approaches is possible. But how to transfer the technology of preparing nanosamples in laboratory to industry first. Second, how to implement or how to fabricate, how to develop the industrial scale of synthesis method on the nanometers and nanostructure systems. For laboratory it's fine, but can we prepare the same nanomaterial at industrial level or at bulk level and how to embed them or how to um, embed in the bulk samples. This is all about the different type of materials as well as the uh, what we say fundamental properties, fundamental issues of the nanostructures. In the next class we will discuss about the 
uh, quantum mechanics or say review of quantum mechanics and introduction of the quantum mechanics.